scores have been attributed to precious stones throughout the ages. People even today wear stones as amulets for their supposed healing and protective abilities. But Hannah, how many of you remember Hannah in, in Samuel? She declared that there is no other rock like our God. No other rock like our God. All power belongs to him. Gemstones are all God's creation. In Romans 1.20, it says, Since the creation of the world, God's indivis- invisible qualities. What are some of his invisible qualities? Romans tells us his eternal power, his divine nature. They've all been clearly seen being understood from what he has made. We can look at some of the things that are made that have been created in this world and actually get a glimpse of who God is. And that's what we're going to do today as we study about stones. Stones in themselves have no power. A lot of New Age people would have you think they do. But they do speak of the power and the glory of God, as we'll see as we're reading. How many of you remember um, also in Scripture where Satan himself was created to be an anointed cherub of God? He literally had all these stones in his body. Let me read this straight from um, Ezekiel 28, 13 through 16. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in you the day you were created. Satan himself had instruments within his own being. They were created in him. Can you imagine the glory of God in heaven and the light shining forth from God to every facet of every stone that was in his being? He was a musical instrument, amazingly beautiful. He was the anointed cherub who covered. That means he had wings. He was put over the worship in heaven. In verse 16, it says, Through the abundance of your commerce, you were filled with lawlessness and violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out of cast you out as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and the garden cherub drove you out from the midst of the stones of fire. The Bible says he walked among the fiery stones. Does anyone in here know which stone is called the fiery stone? A diamond. Good job. It's actually the diamond. He was walking. Where he, where he was, was was diamonds. Can you imagine being able to walk on that kind of beauty? I mean, I just, I can't even fathom that. Now, in Scripture, in Matthew 13, it says the kingdom of heaven is something precious, like something precious, buried in a field. And a man finds that treasure And then he hides it again, and he doesn't tell anybody about it. And then he's so happy, he goes and sells everything he owns just to buy that field because he knows that treasure's there. In Matthew 13, 45, it says, And the kingdom of heaven is like a man who is a dealer in in search of fine and precious pearls. When he finds the pearl of great price... He goes and sells everything he has and buys it because to him it is the most precious thing. That's what God sees in us. You are precious. You are a gem. You are a pearl of great price. He was willing to sacrifice it all to give his own son. Would you give me your son and let me just take a knife and just cut him right here in front of you? No, his love was so great towards his people that he gave everything so that we all 
could live with him for eternity. Is that not awesome? That is a God who wants relationship. He wants fellowship. He doesn't want us to do things. I went through that. I went through that for years. Came out of it and happy that I did. My whole focus on doing things is totally changed. We can work ourselves to death. You can't do it all. You can't do it all. Zechariah 9, verse 16 says, And the Lord their God will save them on that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as the precious jewels of a crown. That's you. Now, in order to really understand what God is saying about you being a stone, some of you might be saying, I don't know, I'm a rock, really? I'm a rock? But wait, let's listen to what the scripture says. In 1 Peter 2, and I'm going to read from 3 through 5. Since you have already tasted the goodness and kindness of the Lord, come to him, the living stone, which men tried and threw away, but which is chosen and precious in God's sight. Come, now he's speaking to the people, come like living stones. First he calls Jesus the living stone. Then he says, people, you come as a living stone. Be yourselves built up into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. That way you can offer spiritual sacrifices that are pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. Now, in Deuteronomy, we've heard this scripture so many times about how we're a peculiar people. How many of you know who peculiar. I mean, I can look across the room, okay. Yeah, we all have a little peculiarness going on. But let's look at the root word. The, the, the scripture is actually Deuteronomy 14, verse 2. It describes what kind of people we shall be. For thou art a holy nation, a people unto the Lord thy God. And the Lord hath chosen you to be a peculiar people unto himself above all nations that are upon the earth. Can I tell you what the root word peculiar really means? Are you ready for this? Are you sure? <laughs> A wise woman speaks. <laughs> it says to shut up wealth, jewel, peculiar treasure, proper, good, special, beyond the ordinary. You are a jewel beyond the ordinary, called by God himself. Some of you are still thinking, oh my gosh, she's telling me I'm a rock. This is weird. Why am I in church today? All right. How are stones or precious gems formed? Now, I teach homeschool. My son David has really blessed me this year in his fifth grade classes because I got to learn a little bit more about how precious stones are formed. You have igneous rock, sedimentary rock, and you also have metamorphic rock. These are different rocks that are, that are created in different layers, basically, of the earth. I'm going to read straight from this because I don't have the, the screen to actually show you this. Minerals form in many different environments in the earth. Most gemstones form in the earth's crust, or the top layer of the earth, which could be anywhere from a depth of 3 to 25 miles down. That's the earth's crust. Can you imagine 25 miles down? These technical terms I used, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic, is just relating to the way that those gemstones are specifically formed in those different ways. The igneous process involves the solidification of magma. Magma is that heated up lava, molten rock underneath the Earth's crust that is constantly flowing. It's what comes out of volcanoes as lava. But what happens is it comes through these channels in the Earth and it begins to cool. It begins to cool. And depending on how it cools, will determine 
what stone is made. If it's got gases in it, it might be a pumice rock. If it has specks of minerals in it, it might become granite. If it has, like, it just cools and there's no weird stuff in it, it ends up becoming this beautiful obsidian rock that's smooth like glass. There's different formations. But all of these, listen to this, increases in pressure can also cause this fluid that surrounds the rock to make chemical changes with them that actually creates the precious stones. So you have pressure, you have heat that create these stones. That's just in the one area, the igneous rock. Then you have um, the igneous rock, once it reaches the surface of the earth, it forces erosion and weathering that produces smaller particles, so basically the wind and the water, and it's throwing it around, and it causes it to become what they call sedimentary rock. Has anyone ever heard of sediment? You know, you get, you get sand in a cup at the beach, and you look at it, and, and it's settled, and all of those particles have fallen to the bottom. That's sedimentary. It's made up of all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, you've got shells in there, you've got sand in there, you've got bones of creatures and bleh, all kinds of stuff in there. They're little pieces. If you put that under heat and pressure, it also would become a stone, a precious gem. So we do realize, and, and metamorphic rock is a whole other thing, that takes heat and pressure. So my point is heat and pressure, heat and pressure. Do you feel any pressure in your life? Hello, you're a precious stone in his sight. He's not going to just let you stay where you are. He's going to turn up the heat a little bit. He's going to let a little pressure come on because what ultimately is going to happen is those impurities are going to rise. Why does he allow us to go through tribulations and trials? So that everyone can see our problems and our issues and our anger and our doubt and our fear. Oh, God wants to see that, right? No, it's so that we know what's on the inside of us. How can God even put his finger on an area to help us out if we don't even realize that there's an issue? So he'll turn up the heat a little bit, and he'll say, okay, I'm just turning it up a little bit. I'm not going to turn it up too hot now because it can damage you. But just enough, he will not put any more on us than we can bear. Amen? Now, you have the scripture in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. We are hedged in, pressed on every side, troubled and oppressed in every way, but not cramped or crushed. We suffer embarrassments, and we're perplexed and unable to find a way out, but not driven to despair. We are pursued, we're persecuted, and hard driven, but not deserted, because he'll never leave us, never forsake us. We are struck down to the ground, but never stuck out and destroyed. Always carrying about the body, the liability and exposure to the same death that the Lord Jesus suffered, so that the resurrection life of Jesus may also be shown forth by and in our own bodies. Why do we go through this process? So that we can become more like Jesus in what he went through. You know that thus the death is actively at work in us. We're dying to our outer nature, our flesh. It's in order that our life may be actively at work in him. Amen. Now, rocks and minerals are constantly in a state of change. Constant. Constant. They don't stay the same. This is referred to as the rock cycle. It stays, it it just keeps moving. It keeps changing constantly. Now, doesn't that remind you of living stones? The scripture we read in 1 Peter, come and be like living stones, just like he, Jesus, is the living stone. 
If we allow that constant change to occur on the inside of us, we become the sparkling jewel that God can shine his light through that other people can see. Just like you would take a diamond and hold it up and shine light through it. It's beautiful. All the colors that are there. When God does a work on the inside of us and he shapes us and forms us into that perfect jewel, we become what other people can see as Jesus. Isn't that awesome? And we've been whining and complaining. Well, why, why are you putting me in this situation? I can't stand this. And, you know, I'm, I'm angry or I'm embarrassed or, you know, I don't understand, God. Why is this happening to me? Why am I in this situation? And we start introspecting. Oh, I made this terrible mistake. And we start beating ourselves up because we did something wrong. And that's what the enemy wants us to do is to stay right where we are, all in the mully grubs, wondering why I'm being tossed around. This is this rock being tossed around. God, what's going on? But in reality, if you don't dwell on your circumstances and the pain and realize that it's for a better good and you still focus on God, even where you are, you are going to end up in a very, very good place. The light will shine through you. God will be, people will be able to see God in you. They will see Jesus in you because your relationship with him has gotten better, sweeter as the days go by. All right. I've got some really fun nuggets here. How are stones cut? I had no idea how stones were cut. I've got a couple of friends who are actually jewelers who... I've never even asked them, you know, how do you cut a stone? And I still didn't ask them. I went online and found out, but that's beside the point. All right. They have this, what they call a lap grinder. And it might be about this big, and it's got a wheel on it that spins. And they have a disc that's like a grinding wheel. And it can be all kinds of different grits. It can be a fine grit, a thick, you know, a heavier grit. And they mount it on top of this wheel. And it spins, kind of like a potter's wheel. It has its rotation. Then they have what they call a dop stick, D-O-P stick. And this is absolutely appropriate to use here. I didn't even know it was up here. A dop stick. This actually almost looks exactly like a dop stick. They put what they call dop wax on the tip, and they affix the stone on it. Now, the stone might start off looking something like this. You know, they they dig for hours with excavators and everything else, and after digging for hours and hours and hours, they might find something so small, so rigid, that looks not as very pretty. It's supposed to be amethyst. Then they find one that's a little bit deeper in color. They're like, wait a minute, we can actually cut something out of that. So what they do is they take it and they attach it to the dop stick with this wax. Here comes the fun part, are you ready? Pretend it's still attached. The wheel's spinning. They, they go down on the wheel with that stone at just the right angle, at just the right momentum, the right time. Sst, 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 and they rotate it to make those different facets. And what they do first is they make it into like a pavilion. You guys know what a pavilion is, where you have like the little pointed area that goes inside the stone first. Well, they'll do the pavilion first. Once they've got it all fashioned and formed, then they'll take another dop stick and reverse it. Now they get to cut it into the shape they want, the marquee or the circle or the oval or whatever shape in the different facets they'd like to do. This is a long, drawn-out process. It takes precision if you're doing it by hand. Nowadays, they have mechanical arms and things that are like computerized, and they're like, and they go right onto it, and they do it themselves. You know, the machine does it. But back in the day, that's how they did this. The whole time, and I'll repeat that, the whole time this is going on, guess what they're putting on the stone, water and or oil. 
Water symbolic of the word of God. Oil symbolic of the Holy Spirit. The whole time that gem is being cut, the word of God is being applied. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is being applied. Every cut, every single time you go through a situation, every single time you go through a process that hurts, God is there. The Holy Spirit's there. The water is there to take the nasty pieces away. It washes off the bits and pieces that have cut. It keeps it from falling off. It keeps it from going too fast. It's a very meticulous thing. Know that when you go through your circumstances, God is with you. He's not going to leave you. You may feel like it's the end of the world when you're getting cut. You may feel like it's the end of the world. But the Holy Spirit is there, and God himself is there to take care of you during that process. Amen? Amen. Now, each of us need to allow God to do that work on the inside of us. What if that stone was on the end of that dop stick, and it started wiggling all over the place? We have to allow God to plant us where we need to be for him to do the work. We can fight it, we can scream, we can kick, we can yell, we can take everybody else down with us, make everybody around us miserable. Or we can just yield to the Holy Spirit's working and allow him to do that work on the inside of us. Amen? How many of you want to yield? Amen. The quicker you yield, the quicker you get there. You can sit out there at that yield sign all day long. You're not going anywhere. Look both ways and keep moving. A yield sign is not a stop sign unless there's somebody coming. Then you stop. But a yield sign, look both ways and keep going. Something I heard Aunt Shirley saying this past week, when you make a mistake or you're going through something in your life and it looks like the page is all written on, all you have to do is turn the page and keep moving forward. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter what you did last week, that sin that antagonizes your mind. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that. I can't. It doesn't matter what you did back there. Turn the page today. It doesn't matter where your brain was two seconds ago. Ask God to forgive you and move on. Clean slate. Clean slate. Confess your faults. God will forgive you. Ephesians 4 Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he's explaining to them the parts of the body and how the parts of the body actually function and how we're all jointly fit together as a body, the bride of Christ. I want us to read this scripture, and let's look at this as stones. Ephesians 4, 16. For because of him, who's him? Jesus. The whole body, or the church, and all of its parts are closely joined and firmly knit together by the joints and ligaments which it's supplied. When each part with the power adapted to its need is working properly and it's functioning, then it grows into full maturity, building itself in love. Now, if Floyd is a, is a ruby, and he's got different flat surfaces. He's all faceted out. And here I am. I come up, and I'm, I'm an emerald. Fit jointly. <laughs> jointly fit together. I do realize that Paul's talking about the body, but we're all precious stones here. And as we'll see later on, the building of the temple and what heaven looks like. Whew, I can't wait to read that. But here we are as people in the body of Christ, jointly fit together. I know your need. You know my need. We know each other, love each other, no matter what anyway. We work together as a team. Need to pray for a dog? I'll pray for your dog. You need me to come over and help clean? I'll come help clean. I need you to come help me? You come help me. We all work together as a team. You need prayer? They're going to call Willie and pray. Whatever it is that you have to offer, I encourage you, use your gift. Use it, because that's how we're going to be fit together perfectly, perfectly together. And when the light shines on that diamond that's right next to the ruby, you're not just going to see the yellows and blues. You're going to get the illuminating 
refractive, refractive, light, refractive light from the ruby as well. It's an amazing thing when God really does that work on the inside of us. So let's not fight him anymore, amen? Now, in the Old Testament, and this may be news for some of you, so I'll give a brief history. In the, in the Old Testament, whenever, um, how, how many of you in here have heard the story of the Israelites? They were in bondage in Egypt. God took them from Egypt. They wandered around in the peninsula where Mount Sinai is. During that time, God gave them instructions on what to do to build this tabernacle, that they were to worship him. They were to do burnt offerings. They were to, to offer prayers there. One of the things that they asked them to build was a breastplate that had all the stones in it that represented the 12 sons of Jacob, Israel. In that breastplate, and those were some of the pictures I would love to have shown you, each one of those 12 sons had a stone assigned to them. As you read through scripture, it'll say, this tribe has this stone, and it's represented in the breastplate by such and such, you know, stone. Those stones are also, a lot of them, found in the New Jerusalem. When you read in Scripture and Revelation, some of those very same stones are seen. Do you ever hear the, the Scripture, the government shall be on his shoulders? Well, one of the things that they had to make for the, for the priest was two onx stones that had six of those names of the children of Jacob on one and six on the other. This is representative of the government because the 12, as Jesus you know, had spoken later on to the 12 uh, apostles, but we also established that this is the government. Whenever you see the shoulders, it speaks of government. Those six sons were written on this stone, six on this stone. Then they had this beautiful breastplate that had all these other stones in the inside. Now that's just to give you a little bit of an understanding of what's going on there. The tribes of Israel, you know, Israel was Jacob. Everybody here, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. All 12 of them had their own stone that represented them. I want to just tell you about a couple of them. Reuben, firstborn son, his stone was listed as the sardis, also considered a ruby or a garnet. So it's really red in color and bright and beautiful. It comes from the Hebrew word odom, which means Adam, to show blood, to flush or turn rosy red. Because of the qualities of that stone, it was used for making signet seals with the ring on the wax. It's also said that the sealing wax would not stick to it. That's why they used it. Its blood red color speaks of us of the precious blood of Jesus. As such, it's one of the foundational stones, and it deserves to be first mentioned and first positioned in the breastplate of the high priest. In each of those stones, it's believed that they were put in the same order of the birth of those 12 children. Simeon was the next born. He has the topaz. Then we have Levi. Levi, scripture says, he has the carbuncle. It's also a precious stone commonly called the garnet. Deep red, solid red. The name garnet actually comes from the Latin word Granitum, which means pomegranate. How many of you remember the pomegranates that used to be on the, the priest's garments? It's very appropriate stone for them. The Ten Commandments. I would like to stop there for a minute because the Levites were the, was the tribe who was also over the preparations of the tabernacle. They took care of that tabernacle I told you about, the burnt offerings, the sacrifices, and everything else. In Scripture, in a Exodus 24, Exodus 31, and Exodus 34, it talks about when Moses went onto the mountain to have the stones of, with the Ten Commandments on it and how God inscribed on those stones the Ten Commandments. And then, of course, Moses broke them and had to go get the stones again. And then also, Joshua had some writing that he did on, on the stones about the law. The root word for all of those, you want to know what the meaning of it is? 
carbuncle. Stop and think about that for a minute. I thought to myself, Lord, you know, when I watched the Ten Commandments on TV, those rocks didn't look like red rubies. Can you imagine? When I saw that, I about fell out of my chair. I was so excited. I thought, Lord, could it be? Could it be that the stone, the root word meaning, says carbuncle? Could it have been a red garnet? Could it have been that bright? I thought, wait a minute now. I'm on the computer. I'm looking. Are there rubies? Are there garnets? What, are these stones found in that region? They are. They're actually found in the peninsula in Mount Sinai area. It's amazing. And I got that um, Erdman's Dictionary, page 223, if you want to look it up. It actually says that it is there. It is very possible that the very tablets that God himself wrote on were written on stone, and not just any stone, but on garnet, carbuncle. How appropriate that the law of God be written on red. It just, it just blew my mind. I cannot tell you how excited I was. I was like, ah! If anybody of you know the way my library is set up, you could have uh, just only imagined how that was. Now, let's move on before I get too bogged down in that. In Judah, Judah's uh, stone is the emerald. It is a very glistening, shining gem that's like a bright green in color. Then we have Dan. I like Dan. Sapphire. That's why I wore my sapphire today. Bright, that, that deep, bright, I say bright, but that deep color blue gem. Of all the gemstones in the Bible... None are more identified with heaven than the sapphire. The sapphire is the great stone of India. Used to be on that peacock throne where they used to take the, the whatever they call them people, the king, emperors and all, that there was a stone that was 104 carats, huge on that peacock throne. Guess who's got it now? Queen Elizabeth. Bam, right there in the middle of her crown. See, the, in Great Britain, sapphires, it's all about sapphires. If you guys ever watched, like, William, not that I really was into all that whole, you know, Katie, whatever her name, yeah, when the prince married, her, her uh, engagement ring was actually a deep sapphire, huge sapphire that um, Princess Diana had. There is one that is 563 carats in the National Museum of History in New York. The sapphire is mentioned in the Talmud as the Shamir stone. It was used of the, uh, and was of the utmost importance because of the important work for which it was used. The temple of God in Jerusalem would never have been built without it. Remember, they couldn't use the iron tools to form the rocks in the temple. They had to take everything out. In 1 Kings 5, 7, it says the king commanded, and they brought great stones, costly stones, and hewn stones to lay the foundation of the house. When David and Solomon began to lay plans for the building of the temple, they were instructed by the Lord that the stones were to be cut at the quarry and shaped, and when they were the perfect size, then transported to Jerusalem. There was to be no more use of hammer or chisel upon the stone which it, when it arrived in the temple at Jerusalem. The only thing that it was allowed to be done to those stones was to smooth it down, any rough st- spots or edges, by the shamir stone. The, sh- the sapphire was used for that. The architects and professional builders of the Temple of Solomon used this stone to finish the work before each of those stones were put in place in the temple. Now, sometimes you may have people that grate on your, on your nerves. Think about it. These stones <laughs> were being rubbed together to get those rough edges off. Mm-hmm. 
we would just assume that these people would just clear out of our way so we won't have to have them around us. But we know that God uses sapphires in our lives to work that work of perfection upon us so that we can fit into our place in his heavenly design in the eternal temple of God. Pressure, heat, other stones. Doesn't it sound like fun? Are you encouraged today? No. In Isaiah 54, 11, it says, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay foundations with sapphires. Hallelujah. God is laying the foundation of the bride of the Lord. He is laying her foundation even now. That foundation, you know, oh Lord, I just want to be strong enough. Oh God, I just want to be able to say no. I just want to be able to, to do the right thing. And God, I just, I really, guess what? He's going to use that stone next to you. He's going to use pressure, heat, whatever it takes. Why? Because he doesn't like you? No, because he loves us. And he wants us to cry out to him in our time of need. Everybody say Neptali. Neptali is the next one. His gemstone is the diamond. The thing that makes the diamond so beautiful is its high refractory power. It is able to refract the light in such a brilliance that it's also called the stone of fire. It is considered the hardest gem. Did you know when that little circle, when that, that lap, hello, the lap grinding wheel is spinning? You know what also is on that grinding wheel? It's a diamond compound. Forgot to tell you that. It's a diamond, like diamond dust, basically. And it's that diamond compound that helps to form that stone along with the grinding and the water and the oil. It's awesome. People believe that Peter was of the tribe of Neptali. Now, why is that important? John 1, it tells us that Philip was of Bethsaida, which is the same town in the city of Andrew and Peter. This is located in the very shore of the Lake of Galilee. It's the area originally allocated to the tribe of Neptali. That is the location that Peter came from when he came and was called to walk with Jesus. Matthew 16, 18 says, And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We've heard that scripture, upon this rock, but the symbolism there with Neptali, coming from the tribe of Neptali, and not everybody believes that, because you know a lot of those tribes, they kind of moved around and they you know, intermarried among themselves, but it's highly believed that he was from Neptali, which makes so much sense. What a stronger rock to build your church on than a diamond. Amen. Solid as a rock. Gad, he, his stone was ligure. I cannot say that properly, but I'll just be a French about a ligure. Asher's was agate, which is um, a, let's see, greenish in color, some black, some brown. Then there was Issachar. Now we're still talking about the sons of, of Isaac, I'm sorry, of Jacob. Issachar had the amethyst, which is a violet or a purple. Then there was Zebulun, had aquamarine. Manasseh and Ephraim were the sons of Joseph. Now Joseph's stone was the onyx, and Benjamin was Jasper. Jasper's stone is also the first stone used in the foundation of the New Jerusalem, the very first one. Isn't it interesting that Benjamin was the last born and his stone is the last inside of the breastplate. However, it's the first one laid in the New Jerusalem. And I remind you of a scripture about many who are first shall be last, those who are last shall be first. That's kind of neat. I like that one too. Now, when, when 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the scripture in um, Revelations, and then I would like to talk about it real quick. This is, um, everyone open your Bibles, if you have them, to Revelations 21. This is what you have to look forward to. And as you're turning there, I want you to think about the glory of God in heaven shining forth through these stones and through heaven. We've heard a lot of people say, oh, heaven, you know, the streets of gold, how beautiful the streets of gold are going to be. And we forget or we, for, or we don't know what else is there. How many of you know that gold, it's not really considered a gem, but it's a metal. It's bright yellow. It's been used for m many centuries. It's very, you know, scarce at this point when it comes to looking for it and finding it. Depending on how thin it was hammered, you could actually hammer it out into what they call gold leaf, very, very thin. If you had 200,000 sheets of gold leaf, are you ready for this? It would make a stack one inch high. When you hammer gold that thin, it becomes transparent like glass. It is absolutely amazing. When you look at your, your jewelry that you have, if it's 24 karat, it's considered the pure, one of the purest pieces of gold. As you go down from there, if it's 10 karat, then it's 10 parts gold and 14 parts of other things added into it. All right? Gold is very soft and very malleable, and it can be beaten very, very small, or thin, I should say. Let's start reading in verse 1. Then I saw a new sky, or heaven, and a new earth. For the former sky and the former earth had passed away, and there no longer existed any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, all arrayed like a bride, beautiful and adorned for her husband. Then I heard a mighty voice from the throne, and I perceived its distinct words, saying, See, the abode of God is with men, and he will live in a camp and tent among them. And they shall be his people, and God shall personally be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be anguish, sorrow, or mourning, nor grief, nor pain any more. For the old conditions and the former old order of things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, See, I make all things new. And he said, Record this, for these sayings are faithful, accurate, incorruptible, and trustworthy, and true. And he further said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I myself will give water without price from the fountain or the springs of water of life. He who is victorious shall inherit all these things, and I will be God to him, and he shall be my son. Now drop down to verse 10. Now this is, the Holy Spirit is giving this to him as he's writing in Revelation. Then in the Spirit he conveyed me away to a vast and lofty mountain, and exhibited to me the holy, hallowed, consecrated city of Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Clothed in glory and all its splendor and radiance, the luster of it resembled a rare and most precious jewel, like jasper shining clear as crystal. It had a massive and high wall with twelve large gates, and at the gates there were stationed twelve angels. And on the gates were the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were written. <coughs> Excuse me. On the east side, three gates. On the north side, three gates. On the south side, three gates. And on the west side, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundational stones. And on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who spoke to me had a golden measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city lies in a square, its length being about the same as its width. And he measured the city with his reed, 
about 1,500 miles is its length and width and the height are all the same. 1,500 miles. Okay, just stop there and think of that, that for a minute. I travel to Oklahoma and Texas every year. Okay, that's a long way. That's how long, wide, high this place is. Just, just think about that. He measured its wall also, 144 cubics, about 72 yards, by a man's measure of a cubic from his elbow to the fingertip, which is the measure of the angel. The wall was built of jasper, while the city of itself was of pure gold, clear and transparent like glass. Wow. The foundational stones of the wall of the city were ornament, or, ornamented with all of the precious stones. The first foundational stone was jasper, the second, sapphire, third, chalcedony, or white agate, the fourth, emerald, the fifth, onyx, the sixth, sardis, the seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, chrysophase, the eleventh, jasonith, and the twelfth was amethyst, and the twelve gates were of twelve pearls. All right. Each gate was one solid pearl. Each gate. Oh, the pearly gates. And we think, oh, the pearly gates. That's nice. No, the pearly gates. One pearl, each gate. That's how big these things are. Absolutely amazing. And the main street, the Broadway of the city, was of gold, pure and translucent as glass. I saw no temple in the city. Uh-oh, there's no temple in the city? For the Lord God omnipotent himself and the Lamb himself are its temple. Now that kind of threw me a little bit because in my Bible school years of learning and training and reading, we had studied about Ezekiel's temple and how, oh, this is what heaven's going to be like and, and everything else. And I'm like, I read this last night and I thought, wait a minute. The city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem coming down, did not have, according to scripture, a temple in it. So what is Ezekiel's tabernacle or temple vision of? I haven't done enough research since I was in Bible school but I'm going to look at that again because I truly believe that it is a foreshadowing of the church as the bride of Christ, just like every other tabernacle and temple that we see. We are the tabernacle of the Lord. He lives on the inside of us. We carry him everywhere we go. Let's keep reading. Verse 23, And the city has no need of the sun nor of the moon to give it light, for the splendor and the radiance of God himself illuminates it, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations shall walk by its light, and the rulers and leaders of the earth shall bring into it their glory. And its gates shall never be closed by day, and there shall be no night there. They shall bring the glory, the splendor and majesty, and the honor of the nations to it. But nothing that defiles it or profanes or is unwashed shall ever enter it nor anyone who commits abominations, unclean, detestable, morally repugnant things, or practices falsehood, but only those whose names are recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we saw that last week in our, our presentation, our movie that we had, about the Lamb's Book of Life and how our names should be written in the Lamb's Book of Life in order for us to be in heaven. Now, we as Christians... I know a lot of you are going through a lot just because I've talked to a lot of you. And if anything, can I please encourage you, let God do the work he's doing on the inside. Just let him do it. It's tough. It's not easy. But I want you to look at your neighbor sitting next to you. Now, you might be looking at the one that's rubbing you like that sapphire rock, but that's okay. Look at someone else for a minute. <laughs> There's other people here. We are all in this together. Can I tell you that it's just like we're all married to one another in that same commitment level? That's it. Same commitment level? 
We are to be committed to one another till death do us part, and even then we're together forever. Think about that. That person that you don't like rubbing up against you here? Ha <laughs> ha. You have a whole eternity to live with them. Let's get used to it. We are learning what we need down here for what we're going to be doing later. And what is that? Oh, flying around like little angels in heaven. <laughs> no, we're going to be ruling and reigning with him. We're not just going to die and go to heaven and just live in this bliss of wonderful eating and laying back and watching God shine through all the jewels in heaven. It's, just, it's not just going to be about worship. It's going to be all of that, but it's going to be him flowing through us continually, guiding, leading, and ruling and reigning with him. It's going to be awesome, absolutely amazing. What we learn down here as a peculiar gem of his will carry on and on through eternity. Don't give up. If you feel like giving up, call one of your brothers and sisters. Please pray for me. I'm telling you, just praying over the phone sometimes is all you need to give you that energy that you need to move forward. Amen? You feel like a stone today? Yeah, okay. Do you feel like a stone today? Are you feeling pretty? Are you feeling like you're chomped on, grinding up by me kind of halfway? All right. Mothers, happy Mother's Day. And just know everything that you do is not for nothing, anything. It is important. What you do, the time you take with your kids and the energy you spend with them, you're raising our future leaders. You're raising our future church. You're going to be sitting out here with your cane, and they're going to be up here. So careful how you train your children and the way they should go, or you'll be following them one day. <laughs> so amen? amen? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I was thinking, yeah, give her a hand. Amen.